This is Novel Marketing, the show for novelists who aren't necessarily fond of marketing, but still want to become best-selling authors. Episode 112. I'm James L. Rupert, but everybody calls me Jim. I'm Thomas M. Stat Jr. And this is the show for novelists who want to become best-selling authors, but aren't necessarily fond of marketing. And in this episode, Thomas, we're going to talk about how to start building your platform before your first book comes out. And I, I'm excited to get into this because I think you and I might disagree on a few points, but I got to ask you about your recent trip. You and Margaret went out of the country recently, didn't you? That's right. So my book on dating and relationships has landed me on a documentary. So the documentary crew uh, had me out to Canada to talk about my book and to talk about uh, dating relationships. We haven't talked about documentary marketing and getting on those, so it'll be interesting to see once the documentary comes out if it has an impact and what kind of impact it has on book sales. So stay tuned. We'll let you know. <laughs> if, if... Oh, that's going to be good. So, so you were, so they were actually filming you. It was you were a part of this documentary was interviewing you and talking to you and that that whole thing. That's right. So somebody else who'd written a very famous book on the topic is changing his views a little bit, and he's making a documentary about kind of that evolution. And so I actually disagreed with his original book, and so this was a discussion between us. It'll be very interesting to see how it works into the documentary at the end. Hopefully I won't come across as the villain. (laughs) So that's always (laughs) a risk when you're in a documentary is that it's not a favorable documentary to a topic. Yeah, that's true. You don't know how it's going to be edited, right? I mean, it could be edited. So, so I know that things change in documentary and filming schedules and all this, but do you have a, is there a tentative release date for when this is going to come out? Yeah. 2018. Okay, twenty eighteen. Sometime, Sometime so. in twenty eighteen. All right, we'll keep <laughs> right. we'll keep everyone posted. So uh, yeah, so this uh, topic about um, marketing for unpublished authors actually comes from a, a listener question. Uh, Carol Magi asks, "I'm an emerging author. I've almost completed a novel, and I've written twenty or more short stories, but I haven't submitted them for publication at this point in time." I understand it's important to have an author's platform, a website, a blog, some kind of exposure. So my question is, if you aren't yet published, what kind of things should you upload to your website? Should you upload a sample chapter from the book, sample short stories, all your short stories to show your range? What should I put on that website while I'm submitting and hopefully getting a contract for that first novel? All right, so I will say, and Jim, you may disagree with this, but I want to first talk about the things not to do, (laughs) some very common mistakes uh, that I see authors make. And one is spending lots of time on social media thinking that it is platform building. And I just don't see this work. I see a lot of authors spending a lot of time on social media that doesn't end up helping them sell books once their book is ready to go. And that time is better spent doing something else, potentially just even working on your craft and writing. Uh, Jim, what do you think? Well, I I think yes and no. Let me give you a specific example of a friend of mine, and I haven't uh, asked her permission, so I'm not going to say her name. But she has spent the last number of years very engaged with a number of social media platforms to the point now that she's an administrator of a number of different sites. And she could easily, when she says, hey, my website's up, my newsletter is ready to go, would you like to subscribe? She could easily, boom, have twelve to 15,000 names come to her like within a matter of days. And so I'm saying, oh my gosh, you've done all this work up front. Um, you could have a huge list when your book comes out already rather than start building that potential list um, once the book's out. So has she actually launched a book? Has she built the list? No, she has not built a list yet because she is still in the process of writing that first novel. Okay, so so I will I will bet you, <laughs> we will see that that social media following isn't actually going to grow her list all that much. When she does post that post saying, "Hey, get on my list," I think she will be disappointed at the number of people. She'll get someone. She'll get some people to sign up, but. The way the um, social media works now, it's an advertising platform. If you're wanting to promote something, you have to pay uh, to play. And all of that time you spend on social media doesn't make it cheaper to buy ads. So I, I, I'm just not convinced <laughs> that it actually works in a reliable way. Now, I, yes, I know stories every once in a while. Somebody is successful. They're like, there's one author who was successful using Twitter, and there's a handful of authors who use Facebook back when the algorithms were different. But, again, it's... 
opportunity cost, it's comparing what you're doing with the next best alternative. And I think the next best alternative, uh, is, which we'll talk about here in a second, is better uh, in the sense of you get a better return uh, on your time. Okay, that that's possible. And it will be curious to see when she is ready to launch, when she does launch her website. Because what I'm saying is she's gotten to be friends with all these people over these years. And so she's built it up to the point, say, if I've got 30,000 people who regularly follow my posts and we know that, you know, we, we can look at the, the analytics and say, yes, this is happening. Maybe 50% of them or maybe 20% of them will say, oh, that's cool that you finally got a website, you've got a newsletter, I've really liked you for the past seven years, I'm going to jump over and be part of that. That's what I'm saying. Okay, but Facebook only shows your post to about 5% of your fans on a fan page. And of those, only a fraction are going to click. So let's say we have 30,000 people. If we take 5% of that, that's 1,500. And then if, let's say, 10% of the people who see it click... Now we're down to 150, and let's say half of those people sign up for the newsletter. That's only 75 signups off a list of 30,000 people on Facebook. Well, well, let's. Uh, <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what what happens down the road. <laughs> we want to hear your experiences. If you have tried social media uh, and if if it's worked or not worked for you as an unpublished author, go to novelmarketing.com forward slash 112. And we have, we'll have comments open for 14 days after this episode comes out. Let us know what your experiences are. Who do you agree with, Thomas or Jim? Yeah, we'd like, to hear, we, we'd like to hear. So <laughs> Thomas and I are it's somewhat, we're talking about hypothetical situation because it hasn't been done yet. We'd like to hear concrete examples of either it's worked or you go, wow, I wasted a lot of time doing this. <laughs> so the next thing I would say don't do with your marketing is don't bother with blogging. If you're writing fiction, no one cares about your blog. There's nothing really to blog about yet because you don't have a book out. Uh, totally different for those of you who are writing nonfiction. I, when I wrote my nonfiction book, it started from a blog post. Half of the chapters were blog posts before they were chapters, and the whole thing was born and crafted and molded from the blog. Uh, but for fiction, no one wants to read some chapter out of context, and blogging is just not a good use of your time. It's not that it won't do you any good, but the other things we're going to talk about are going to do you more good. Okay. Again, here, Thomas, I disagree a little bit. I, I agree that the main thing should be the book and writing the book and honing your craft. However, if you have the ability, and not everyone has the ability to do this, but if you have the ability to create compelling blog post that's not about your story and it's not chapters i agree with you but if you are someone that can create compelling blog posts about the themes that run through all of your books your brand in a sense then it can be highly beneficial if you're yeah i, I can see that working if you're writing um, novels that are like educational and the reason people read your novel is to be educated on something. So if you're like writing a business parable or like a spiritual parable, uh, I could see that working. But if you're writing like Amish romance, I don't see that really like people wanting the themes and then reading the book. I, that's, I see that as a hard sell. Uh, but again, let us know what you think. <laughs> Novelmarketing.com forward slash 112 uh, to leave your comments. So let's talk about things to do. <laughs> yeah, see if Jim and I will agree a little bit more on this. Uh, so the first thing I will say, uh, Carol, is that those short stories are assets that you can use in terms of marketing. And I would start submitting them to um, publications that are, you know, that publish the kinds of short stories that you're writing. I think that that's a great opportunity, one, to get feedback. Uh, if they accept you, you'll get some editing for free on those short stories. You also potentially get a little bit of money which can have really positive tax implications once you start to get paid for your writing. Suddenly, this is not a hobby. This is a business, and you can start taking advantage of tax deductions. Uh, we have a whole episode on taxes uh, that you can listen to. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would not let those short stories gather dust on your hard drive unless they're really bad. <laughs> so I don't know if they're good or not. Uh, and only good short stories will help you in your marketing. Well, and if you submit these short stories, and let's say they're good, they're not great, let's say they're good, if it gets an editor's attention and they come back and they give you feedback and shaping and molding, this is one of the best ways you can hone your craft is getting that kind of feedback, resubmitting the story, getting it published. It's a chance for not only to get paid potentially, but even if you're posting those stories for free, you're getting paid in the editing that you're going to get from a, from a strong editor. Uh, the next thing I would recommend is that you create a one-page WordPress website 
uh, for uh, onyourname.com. Uh, so this is the time to pick what your name is going to be. And in general, if we have done several episodes on like what to do if your name is taken, and I'll just summarize it real quick. At this point, you're probably going to have to go with a three-name name. So it's better to be uh, James Scott Bell than it is to be James S. Bell because people drop the middle initial. Not that that ever happens to anyone on this particular podcast. <laughs> huh, James L. Rubart? <laughs> no, never happened to me. <laughs> so so, you, so it was so funny. So, Thomas, I have to interrupt. It's like, um, uh, you know, I, I won this. Christie Award. Um, oh yeah, we forgot to mention that at the top. You you won Book of the Year again, uh, and yet another category. So uh, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So so that was that was very fun and very honoring to to win that. But a number of times during the ceremony and looking in the program, it's like they got up to announce the winner, and the winner of the Visionary Christie Award is James Rubart. And I'm going L L L, please. <laughs> and so if you're and the reason why this is important for your website is if your website is jameslrubart.com and you don't own jamesrubart.com people are going to the wrong website which is very very bad for your marketing so better to have a three name website that you can own so pick pick a name buy the .com and you're going to set up the world's simplest website and there's several reasons why you want a simple website one is that when you when your book does come out you want your website to be able to rank on Google. And one of the things that Google looks at is how old your website is. So brand new websites have a hard time ranking. Google's very suspicious of brand new websites. And so it takes time to build up that reputation, to build up that history. And so you might as well start the timer now. Let's say it takes you two, two years to finish your book. Well, now you're launching your book with a website that's two years old in the eyes of Google which is time you can't get back. There's no way to like cheat that or pay money to like escalate the time. You just got to launch that website. Thomas, let me let me ask you a quick question, Thomas, about that because this is something I've heard I heard years ago and I don't know if it's still true or not, but I've heard that when you purchase that domain name, um Google and SEO likes the fact that you've bought it for five years instead of one year because it says you're committed to it um and it gives you some more Google juice. Is that true? Um, I've heard that that's true. The other thing that's really beneficial for buying your name for many years ahead of time is that it keeps your name from expiring. I will say that this is, you know, we host lots of websites for lots of authors, and the number one thing that causes the website to go down is that they let their domain expire. They get it for just one year, and then they get the email telling them to renew, and their credit card was you know, lost six months ago, so they have a new number, and they're on vacation, and now they've lost their domain. And we have one client she did, and there's no way that we as the hosting company can help them with this because they own their own domain name. We have one client who let her domain expire and somebody else bought it and won't sell it back to her for anything less than like 500 or or $1,000. And if she had just spent a little bit of extra money to register it for 10 years, which was money that she was going to spend anyway, it would have protected her from that. And even when you're able to recover it, your site goes down. And when your site goes down, that hurts your Google juice. So there's lots of reasons to register your domain name for many years, even if you don't, even if the algorithm has changed and you don't get as much of a boost. And also with these hosting companies like, oh, we'll give you a free domain. I don't recommend that. <laughs> get your domain from a third party. It gives you a lot more control in the relationship. You don't want your the company that hosts your website to also um, be your registrar for your domain name. Too much, too much eggs in one basket. Um, so the other reason why it's good to have a website is that it makes you Googleable. So if you're talking, if you, especially if you're wanting to go traditionally published, being Googleable helps you kind of exist in the world. If you don't exist on LinkedIn, if you don't exist on Google, it's hard to, to believe that you're for reals about this. And it doesn't cost a lot of money to set up a one-page website. And the other benefit of a one-page website is it allows you to start building your email list right away. Even if you're growing it really slowly, you you're still getting something so like jim we were talking at the top your friend who's spending all of this time on social media instead of working on her marketing her book or writing her book and not building her list at the same time if she just had a one-page website with a sign-up form she could be growing her list and seeing if what she's doing on social media <laughs> is, is effective is, or not yep, right is, now is it's it a huge gamble right she could have invested <laughs> these hundreds of hours on social media and maybe it'll t pay off maybe it won't but she could find out now if it's paying off because if it's not paying off she could redirect her energies, her efforts uh, somewhere else. Right. And so put a sign up form, put your photo, put a little about paragraph and put a progress bar about your book. And if you're wanting to add a free progress bar, you can add my book progress. We have a plugin to help you do this uh, very easily. You can add a progress bar to your one page 
website. And uh, the other, the only other thing I would recommend putting on this one-page website is perhaps a, a what I'm reading section where you list some of the books that you're reading at the time. Very simple website. And here's the benefit of this. Since this website doesn't have a blog, once it's set up, you can leave it alone, <laughs> uh, which means that you're able to spend your time on the most important part of how to market yourself before your book comes out, which is working on your craft. Because if your book, if your novel is not good, none of the rest of it is going to matter. I'm assuming you guys know this, but just in case, Thomas and I recommend doing your website in WordPress. If you want to add a blog, that is very, very simple down the road. So it's not a it's not a matter of, oh, but I want to add a blog eventually. I want to start blogging. Great. You can do that very simply, very quickly. That 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 can be done. That's right. You go to bluehost.com, you can get a WordPress blog, I don't know, or WordPress website, seven or eight bucks a month, and you can install and set up WordPress with one click. Which let me tell you, when I was a kid it was a lot more clicks than that. It was much harder. So you kids these days, you do not know how good you've got it when it comes to setting up WordPress website. Um, the other thing that I would do, and I think this is really important uh, psychologically as well as marketing wise, and that is get business cards printed up with your name on them and then underneath it says author. <laughs> so you are an author and it's got your website on it and you can pass them out when you're at whatever. You know, you're at a Christmas party and somebody's like, oh, what do you do? And you're like, oh, actually I'm working on a book. Here's my card. And that way you're starting to bring people to your website. So they may sign up for your newsletter. It's a great way to start building that platform uh, before your book comes out and to start seeing yourself as an author, which is really important. That's good. Uh, another thing to do to market your book before your book comes out is to sign up for MailChimp. So I really like MailChimp because uh, it's free for your first 2,000 subscribers. So while it's going to be slow starting, right? Passing out business cards is not the fastest way to grow an email list. Um, but at least you're not going to have to pay, you know, 20 bucks a month every month like you would with other services like Constant Contact. So, so Jim, what's the next thing people should do to... The next thing people need to do is the number one marketing thing for... Um, your first book, your second book, your 10th book, your 200th book. And that is, and you know where this is going, invest in your craft. We've said this many times, but it's worth repeating 80%. 80% of your sales will come from word of mouth. Therefore, your biggest brochure is going to be that 300 or 400 page book. If that's done well, people are going to tell other people going to tell other people. So consequently, you need to invest the majority of your time in honing your craft, getting better and better and better. Even if you've been published, multi-published, best-selling, award-winning, all that stuff, even if you're in, the, in those shoes, you probably know more than anybody that the, the number one thing you can do marketing-wise is invest in your craft. Now, you'll notice we're not recommending lots of active things. So the thing you should be spending most of the time on is investing in your craft and arguably most of your money on, right? So we're not ex recommending an expensive website here. A very simple one-page website. It's not going to cost you very much money uh, to build. You want to be spending that time and that money on your craft. That is like taking courses, getting coaching, uh, making sure your book is as good as it can be. And one of the things that you can do is send out a free short story, uh, to your email subscribers every once in a while. And that can be, you know, you're at that Christmas party, you're at that, uh, you know, cocktail party, and people ask, oh, what do you do? And it's like, oh, I'm an author. If you want to see some of my writing, go to my website. I release a short story, you know, every few months. You can take a look at it. And that way, you're actually being read, and your writers are, your readers are starting to engage with your reading, and you're very focused on the craft uh, while you're promoting your work. And you often will get feedback from people saying, I liked it, I didn't like it, this kind of thing. Then you're getting, we talked about submitting short stories to editors, so you get the editorial feedback. Now you're going to be submitting it to readers, the ultimate uh, editor or the ultimate audience, and you're going to start getting feedback from them as well, which can be incredibly valuable. Because if you think, oh my gosh, this story is great, this short story, and you don't get a lot of feedback, you send out another short story and you get a lot of feedback. It's like, wow, you might surprise yourself. Often actors will say or ask, did you know this was going to be a great film before it came out? They go, I, we had no clue. We just did not know. And a lot of times we're so close to our stories that we're not sure if it's going to resonate or not. I've had some of my novels where I go, oh, my gosh, this is going to be fantastic and it's not as lauded as other novels so that's just that's just part of the art form uh, the next thing we would recommend uh, of ways to promote your book before your book comes out is to attend writers conferences <laughs> so uh, this is helpful in honing your craft and in helping to learn 
marketing. So as you get closer to your book coming out, that's when you want to start studying marketing and doing some of the more active things uh, that we talk about in the rest of this podcast. Attending writers' conferences is a great way to do this. It's also a great way to build your network. Whether you're going indie or you're going traditional, having a network of other authors and other industry professionals is really helpful. So I, I recommend starting off with the local conferences. They tend to be cheaper. You don't have to pay for travel and lodging. But um, after a while, you'll want to start going to some of the national conferences that may involve you know leaving your hometown and if there's a national conference coming to your hometown go to it it's so much cheaper to go to a conference in your own town than it is to travel to one on the other side of the country we've talked about this a lot in the past so we won't go into it but business ultimately i don't care what business you're in ultimately business comes down to relationships and conferences are one of the best place to build relationships yes with editors and agents but my gosh with other authors that can be a huge boost to your career that's right. And then finally, we just, I just want to reiterate one more time, write your book. So this, this whole uh, episode is basically saying, Carol, you need to be spending most of your energy writing your book and not on marketing your book. Uh, I think when marketing is taught uh, to both fiction and nonfiction at the same time, novelists are really done a disservice because they're told the same advice that goes uh, for nonfiction, that it's all about platform. And with fiction, it's not really about platform, especially for your first book. It's about how good your book is. (laughs) So if your book is no good, it doesn't matter how big your platform is. This is not the case for nonfiction. You can write a terrible book with nonfiction. And if your platform is big enough, you will sell a lot of copies, even if no one reads the book. You will still sell a lot of copies because they heard you speak somewhere or they listen to your radio show or they subscribe to your newsletter and they've been reading your blogs and they'll buy your book and everyone is happy because uh, they, they buy your book for the experience of buying your book and the way that it makes them feel, right? So you're a diet expert and people buy your book and they don't read it, but they still feel like they're healthier because they have a diet book now on their shelf. Financially speaking, you still win in nonfiction. That is not how it works in fiction world. <laughs> people actually, when they buy a novel, they intend to read the novel. And uh, when if you look at your bookshelf, the books that are unfinished are mostly the nonfiction books. And the f- books that you finish, uh, or the, especially the books that are not started. You, if you look at your nonfiction shelf, you will see a lot of books that you purchased and never started reading. <laughs> uh, that is not the case typically with the novels that you buy. And so it's so important for you to actually write your book and to actually write a good book. Uh, so you think, oh, we're the Novel Marketing Podcast. We're going to be all about marketing your novel. Yes, but ultimately for your first novel, it's really about writing the best novel you can. Marketing really comes into play with books two on. It does. And let me just say a quick caveat Thomas. And that is a lot of times people will say, well, 20 years ago, nonfiction, you had to have a platform fiction. You didn't. And nowadays you have to have a platform as a novelist. And I think you do. And if an agent or an editor is trying to decide between two novelists and both books are great, they are going to pick the one that has, if they feel the sim- similar about the, the stories, they are going to pick the novelist who has the better platform. So in that sense, you do need to be thinking about platform. But here's where novelists have it backwards a lot of time. They don't realize that if you have a great f- platform and you have a poor book, you're, it's never going to get to the stage where they're going to take a look at your platform. So always, 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 number one, it needs to be the book. Right. For fiction, at best, your platform is a tiebreaker for your very first novel. Uh, it doesn't, it, like what Jim said, it's not. it doesn't make or break you. And I was just on the phone with a major, with somebody from a major publishing house. I was talking with them about how they evaluate platform. They are not very sophisticated. <laughs> They're just looking Good at point. the number of Twitter followers you have and the number of Facebook followers you have. If, if, if you're tra- int- intending to go traditional, just buy some fake Twitter followers. You can very easily have 30,000 <laughs> followers you know, that cost you pennies on, or if just you can get there with 50 bucks on you know buying follower farms to follow you um it, it it's sad that they're not more sophisticated these traditional publishing companies but the reality is if they were sophisticated they wouldn't be following social media <laughs> i ran marketing for a publishing company we did tons of experiments with social media and we did not see it as effective as anything else that we did yeah we were able to sell books through social media but we were able to sell more books through every other effort that we did and on a per dollar basis social media was just not an effective tool with the exception of goodreads uh and i I kind of see goodreads as a separate category when it comes to social media. yeah i agree and real quick i will say the one 
get on Goodreads. <laughs> One more thing I'll add to this list uh, is get on Goodreads and start reviewing the books that you're reading. That's all you have to do. Just be active on Goodreads as a reader. That will actually help you build your following because people will follow your reviews. And then when you do post a book, they'll all be notified on Goodreads. And the kind of people who are on Goodreads are looking for book recommendations, and that does convert. So it, this also doesn't take a lot of time. You may already be using Goodreads as a reader. Um, but uh, I think that is uh, one social network that I would actually give the Thomas Umstead stamp of approval as worth your time and not a waste of time is Goodreads.com. Yeah, and it's not it's not that social media is a waste of time, but the way to think about it is it's it's like this big cocktail party. And at the cocktail, the big cocktail party, it's everybody from all different walks of life. Goodreads is a sub party that everyone uh, that loves to read happens to gather in this one room. And they're talking about what books they le- they read and how much we love to read and how we read on Kindle or, or paper. And, and then they start sharing recommendations with each other. You want to be in the little sub room where they're actually talking and recommending and telling we- what each other to read. Yeah, you do not want to be in the room where everyone is arguing about politics. That is not where people are going to get their book reviews. <laughs> their book and that sadly is what all the other social networks are turning into. It's like, what team are you on? Red team or blue team? And let's hate on the other team because they're idiots. And that's just not a good co- environment to try to talk about your book, about whatever it is, whatever novel you're writing. Okay, so guys, the the sponsor of the Novel Marketing Podcast for this episode is the five-year plan to becoming an overnight success. Thomas? So uh, if you're just getting started writing your book, um, we have an amazing resource for you that will take you through how to build a career from novice to best-selling author. And it's it's a five-year course uh, that takes you quarter by quarter what you should be doing this year. It's a very specific plan. And, you know, people are looking to cut corners and they're looking for shortcuts. This is not the course for those people. (laughs) This is the course for people who are wanting to do it right. And a lot of the things that we're talking about, about honing your craft, will walk you through specifically how to hone your craft, how to become a better author. And um, I will say the price is going to be going up again. Uh, We have just woefully underpriced this thing, (laughs) which was a good educational experience for me. I realized like what courses are supposed to be priced at. And um, probably early in 2018, we'll be raising the price. So if you want to get in at the current price, now is the time <laughs> to check out the five-year plan. And it's we're so confident about this. It has two different guarantees. There's a 30-day, whatever reason, money-back guarantee will refund your credit card. But there's also a five-year guarantee. If you do everything we recommend in the course and it doesn't work for you and you're not a best-selling author... Let us know, and we will write you a check for what you paid for the course five years later for the course. That's how confident we are that this really will work. And so if, if you're wanting to do things the right way and you're willing to put in the work, this course will tell you what to do to actually be successful. And it's based off of Jim's experience becoming a best-selling author who tends to win all of the awards for best novel. <laughs> um, and you know, he wins the Christie Awards, he wins the Carol Awards, and then my experience as a consultant. I've worked with many, many New York Times best-selling authors and other best-selling authors and um, you know, worked with them and helped them grow. And it, I'm sharing what I've learned. So it's an insider's perspective and a consultant's perspective in each quarter. I think you really like it. And you can find more at novelmarketing.com. You've been listening to the Novel Marketing Podcast with Thomas Umstead Jr. and James L. Rubart, giving you novel marketing ideas on how to promote yourself and your writing online, offline, and everywhere in between. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.